So we built Vimbly in the shadow of the tool that um, we wished existed. So that was one reason to do that. And I felt like I would, if I wanted to pursue the opportunity to do that, I couldn't do it half time or be working somewhere else and doing that. You can't be half a gangster. You really have to go all in or not. The water's fine, homie, jump into the deep end. So it you will reap it. We're talking how to start it, how to grow it, how to keep it. Take a deep breath. You are now rocking with found. I'm I'm so excited to have Sam here do an introduction. Sam, the CEO of Vimbly Group. Uh, they started as a website and then evolved over time to acquire a number of business units and Amazon brands, and they own some technology companies and invest in technology companies. So we're so excited to have them here. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. See you, Sam. I don't even know how many businesses Sam has founded. How many businesses have you founded? So there are nine business units in the Vimbley Group, I would say. Uh, how many did we found, you know, a, a portion of those since... You know, we've acquired businesses and some of them are joint ventures that we've created with others over time. So. All right. Well, this is our purpose today is to somehow unpack everything that's going on, like behind the Sam, like brain. I okay. feel like I always want to do this. I like, you know, we know each other, we hang out, but I still feel like I know so little of like what's behind the scenes. You know what I mean? The, the founder secrets. I feel like I don't, I, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I have a question around like how did, you know, Vembly started as a web, an events website really. And then how did you evolve that? You know, that was the business for some period of time. And then how did you evolve? You know, was it an accident that you started these other businesses? Was that the vision all along or how, how, how did you evolve that into kind of a holding company in a way? Um, it was through the discovery that it would be useful to license our IP to others in exchange for a rev share or equity stake in their businesses. In general, we had technology that was useful to others and we could repurpose that. And that would be both lucrative to us, it would be high margin and it would be useful to them because they would save a lot of time, money and energy as opposed to trying to do everything themselves. And that was profitable. And so that discovery was by happenstance. But once we discovered that, we continued doing that. Did you like build with that in mind, like we have this problem right now. We're like, hey, what if we've sold our technology to these other companies? And as soon as I brought that up, like, oh, well, we have to rebuild the whole product to make it multi-tenancy. And we have like, there's no, it just feels like so much is tied to the core business. They're like, oh my God, it's gonna take forever to sell this same technology to somebody else. So like, how did you do that? It happened one step at a time. We had a, so no, we didn't build with that in mind. Eventually, it came to mind, it was something we would focus on. But an example would be, we had a Craigslist bot that could generate traffic from Craigslist postings. <laughs> and that was a difficult item to have. And that was possible to use for other listings. We used that for classes, activities, and events, those three categories on Craigslist. Like to post To things. post. And so that, you know that would be one way to generate traffic for us. and. Craigslist did not want you doing this or posting a, using a bot to do it because as soon as you post something, it gets buried because a lot of people post something. So to have something that could keep you at the top of Craigslist would be very useful. They don't want that, but we had a mechanism for doing that. And then when someone else wanted that and needed to use that for a different listing altogether that was not competitive with us, a different category, we were able to license that to them. And they came to us asking to license it and we said, okay. And so that's how that began. Hmm. And so we built it purely for our own purposes, and then we were just able to, you know, slightly reconfigure it and then be able to let someone else use it. And we don't transfer away any IP. It's just a great deal to do that. All right. Let's back up a bit. You were in, like, what did you do after school? After college, I did investment banking, mergers and acquisitions. And then after that, I did tech investing at a hedge fund, focusing on public market opportunities. It's like, why leave this profitable you know, personally profitable career, not to mention like you could start a lot of those people that are very successful and that might start their own hedge fund. So how did you peel off from banking? Well, the, uh, leaving from banking to the hedge fund, that was the natural progression. Leaving the hedge fund world was not expected or controversial item to do. There were three reasons why I did it. The main reason was the opportunity for Bimbley.com came up, which was to activities. It's, it's recreational activities and make them be bookable. I was going on safari in Africa. I want to take good pictures. 
bought a DSLR, realized did not know how to take how to use it at all. So um, wanted to take classes, started looking for the classes. Super hard to find that even in New York City, pinnacle of convenience. But this is three hour research process to find it. So we built Vimbly in the shadow of the tool. So that was one reason to do that. And I felt like I would, if I wanted to pursue the opportunity to do that, I couldn't do it half time or be working somewhere else and doing that. You can't be half a gangster. You really have to go all in or not. So is that, that a real origin story? So that is a real origin story. That's, that's one of the reasons. So that was one of the, you know, and so I wanted to do that. I thought it was an exciting space. I wanted, I wanted to pursue it. The second component, which is also real origin story is that, so what I would focus on would be tech companies. One of the things I focused on was tech companies that were going public. And there was this theme of previously opaque offline inventory coming online. So OpenTable pioneered this with restaurant reservations. And then ZocDoc had mm-hmm. come out and was yeah. doing this for doctor inventory. And this was going to slowly happen for every vertical. And I thought, okay, I could sit here and invest in this one day when a company does this, mm-hmm. or I could seek to do it myself. And so that was the impetus for wanting to do it with Vimla.com. So cool. And and we say we, it's you and Chris, and Chris. your co-founder. Right. Curious if you tile a bit like how did you decide to do this with Chris or I guess you could have done it by yourself or someone else or did he have the same pain point or how did that come about? Yeah, I mean, it came from the fact that Chris is, you know, the smartest engineer I know, right? He's kind of like super brilliant guy who kind of could program in his sleep, just doing it since the age of 10, like in his, with his eyes closed. And so and we were close friends. And so when the time came, we were kind of in touch about this type of item, whether even before the specific idea for Vimla.com, we were aligned on trying, on launching a business. And it was a matter of figuring out what it would be that would make sense. And so... Chris is the technical side of it. Chris is the one that built the Craigslist bot and figured it out. And he did it on a piece of paper, right? And I was in the room when it happened. I wish I had it recorded. So it was like in a movie where he like breaks the cipher uh, by hand, <laughs> like drops the pen, like runs the computer, tries it, and it works. And it was great. That's amazing because uh, they have like captures and stuff. Like it's not trivial to to do that. All great questions for Chris as to how it works. And how, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did. Did, did you all have other ideas first and, and you're like, ah, you know, this looks like a good idea, but wasn't a fit or, or did you just hit gold? You happen to hit gold on the first Well, one. no, we, we, we had a previous idea. It was called Milk the City, but it, which is kind of a weird what a name. name. <laughs> yeah. But it really just. It, so lactation consulting group. <laughs> <laughs> right. And that was, it was an idea to, it was like a Groupon daily deal style site, but um, it was an idea that we kicked around that we explored. We had never focused on it on a full-time basis. This is this predated Vimbly by two years or what, you know, some some long amount of time or a year. And so that was just an idea that we talked about and explored doing, but we didn't go very far with it. But the, the most useful takeaway from that was that in order to do something, we would have to do it full-time. Can you speak to how you, you knew this was going to win? Because, you know, you came from a career where you're making a lot of money and you, you had status and success and all those things. And then to take a leap, right, to do something that you didn't know was going to be successful, I assume. But at what point, you know, was there a moment when you said, oh, wow, this is really going to be a thing? You know, I'm, I'm glad I took this step. Right? I'm, I'm glad this worked. You know, I, I didn't know it was going to win. But when I was starting, you know, I, it could have everything could have gone terribly. And solace, I found, was in knowing that the downside scenario was I would lose a year and then I would return to industry and I would have that experience behind me. And so then once I understood the downside and I thought the downside wasn't so bad, it wasn't that big of a deal, it was liberating to be able to mm. chase the upside. Uh, interesting. Talk about like, r- like you guys raised a little money in the beginning, but then decided not to, I guess, tell me how you think of like, yeah, finan- yeah maybe Vimbly specifically, but how you think financing for early stage startups, you know, well, I guess what you learned from it. We raised early on a total, something like 700K in total for all the money we raised. And we had the intention of raising more money later. The goal was that was our seed round. We would later raise a Series A and go down that route. And what happened that we didn't expect was that we were able to make Vimbly profitable and we would not later need to raise money again. And so that that was nice. And that was a different, that was a turn of events. That was different from what I thought would happen. And... You know, over time, what I would learn about, I think that there's two very different routes, the venture route and the non-venture route. And there are wide ramifications for how the company will work, how it will operate, who's in control, who's in charge, what the expectations are. And there are different lives to be led. And I think there are pros and cons in either direction. 
I like the direction we've taken, which fortunately worked out this way. So I, I think it's a different world going the venture route. Having said that, I don't think it's bad or wrong or anything like that, but it's just a different route. And so it was interesting how that played out for us as a result. I mean, that's a lot of people don't talk about that, right? They they expect you raise money and then you just keep raising until either you know you go bust or you IPO or sell to Adobe for twenty billion dollars. <laughs> But I, I think this path is not talked about, right? In, in that you, you thought you were on that path, but then you turn profitable and the company continues. And I guess, would you ever sell it at any point? Or how do you view the exit, if you will, of this business? I love what we're doing. I love what I'm doing. I, I don't plan to sell. The, the, you know, I think that I would do this forever, right? Like, I like the team. I like, I like, I like everything. I like the nature of the work. Of course, you know, it's on my mind, though, that everybody needs to be happy. By that, I mean employees need to be happy and, and those early investors need to be happy and I want them to be happy. And so in the situation that there was a need for liquidity, we'd be able to figure out a solution. What I mean by liquidity for shareholder liquidity. E eventually, there will be some methodology to enable that and whether that's an IPO or otherwise. How would you... Uh counsel somebody starting a business to and they're thinking about how to raise money and maybe it's tech you know maybe it's similar to the kind of position you were in what, what would you have any advice for them about whether to money. go yeah about you know you have a startup and and they want to start something new would, would, would you have any advice or feedback for them on that well traction is everything and i think that there's this choice between okay let's say they're money versus team versus traction and which one's the most useful one to have of those? I would submit the answer is traction, right? One, one, there are examples of startups that have plenty of money that they were able to raise and traction was never found and that was that's a problem. Or even good teams coming together without being able to have traction there. But if traction exists, if it works, if, if there is this product market fit, then everything else is able to work as well. The money will come and even the team will come. So the pursuit of traction to me seems like the most sensible and useful pursuit of anything and way to spend time. So I think the best deal from a founder point of view can be had by not raising money at the first possible moment, but instead having as much traction as possible before mandatorily needing to raise money, if needing to raise money at all. How, how like how, how did you all get early traction? You, you know, in, in your mind, was it getting a first few, getting a digital SLR, DSLR class on there and getting 15 people to sign up? You, you know, it's it's how, how do you get over that first hurdle or how did you get over that kind of initial hurdle to get that first class on there and the first booking and all that? So, well, for, so the first thing we did the, the, the in the very beginning, it was me and Chris. Right. And we started expanding the team, but the, we didn't raise money for a year. And in that time, we just wanted to demonstrate any level of growth or traction that we could. So we needed to, you know, so Vimbly is a pl marketplace platform, Vimbly.com, and there will be vendors, the vendor side and the user side. And the challenge is with, with any two-sided marketplace, there's a chicken or egg problem. And if we had no activities, no one would want to ever use the site and book something. And Likewise, if we don't have users, why should vendors sign up and be able to use it? And so we instead simulated vendors. We would put up representative vendors that we thought were really good. And then if someone made a booking, we would call that vendor and say, hey, we have someone who wants your class. <laughs> oh, by the way, we're Vimbley. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that mostly worked fine, actually, because then... Or so we thought it would work fine. And it mostly did because if you call them and say, hey, this, someone wants to book your class or here's someone booking your class, not even explain anything else, they're going to go along with it and be OK with it. Um, and then eventually we're like, OK, hold on. This is we kind of need to make sure we have relationships with every vendor because otherwise we're posting information and it's bookable and, you know, vendors might – it, it, it needs to be kosher. And so then we had this cleanup process after that w in order to do that. But but the key insight was that this enabled us to not have to solve both sides of the platform at the same time. We could instead focus just on users because we just we had the vendors already because we didn't have the contract with them. We weren't making money on it. They wouldn't pay us any commission. We'd actually lose a little bit of money if there were some credit card fees or something like that if we took money in the middle. But um, it worked out. Also, we explored what we called – basically, they, they paid directly to the vendor instead of paying us money at all. So we were an, an intermediary and no money would be lost there. We were just facil – we were almost like a concierge facilitating people finding activities. And that was also a kosher way of doing it until we formed formal relationships with those, with those vendors. Was there a point in time that you picked that if you weren't going to hit X metric by that point, 
that you would try something else? Or how would you, how would you set that to be one year and not, you know, 10 years? I mean, it's a great point. And if, if I were doing it today, I would be even more concrete with like what exactly failure or success looks like. We didn't, uh, you know, the reality, we kind of, I had this idea that like, okay, let's see if it works. If it works, wasn't defined, right? So that's something that was vague. And if it doesn't, then okay, it doesn't work. So we didn't have a definition of it. I'm a big fan of clarity. I think that today with any experiments, we want that level of clarity. Like what does success look like? What does failure look like? How do we fail fast or succeed or know if we're on the path to failure or success? Well, how much longer could you have funded it by yourself, by yourselves? Well, our costs were very small, you know, so it, it, we went for a year with, uh, before we raised that money. And so what we're talking about is not generating a salary, Chris not generating a salary. We had uh, an early teammate, Simone, who's amazing, and he joined. And so then we didn't have, you know, we had some office costs, but our costs were small and lean. So how long could we have kept going for? It's hard to say, not very long, but we, we wanted to kind of either, if had we not ra raised that external money, we probably would have stopped. Right, that, that initial 700K, which by the way, didn't come at 700 at once. It was maybe 540 and then another 100 or another 150, something like that. It was it, it was 500K that ended up being 700K, something like that. But that money ended up being like important, right? It ended up being very meaningful to be able to pay like bare bones salaries and bare bones keep it going. Plus, it probably kind of gave everybody a view of, hey, if these people are willing to put in half a million dollars into mm -hmm. this, then... We should keep going. <laughs> right. It, there's a lot of the business was powered by the passion of, of the team, you know, that I had for it, that Chris had for it, that Simone had for it. And I think that was very useful in that, like, it was very fun. We really enjoyed it. It was a good group and it still is a great group. And that made a big difference because people felt that energy and that enthusiasm. I thought that was helpful. Oh, man. I remember going to your office one time and you had some sort of like hackathon of like some live sports. Oh, the betting, betting yeah, in right. real time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whatever happened to that, by the way? <laughs> right, so that was, um, that was mini bet. So the context behind mini bet is that is, so it became legally possible to begin betting on sports. And there's a bunch of hurdles that exist in order to do that. But one could, in theory, start jumping through the hurdles. And we anticipated that people would, this would be a new industry that would come forth. And so we started exploring this and we were investing in launching Minibet, which would be a product to be able to do that. And so what you're talking about was when we had a beta for the product and that we were exploring how to do it. And that's the context. So what happened with that, we, we, we've we put that project on hold as we're not actively developing on it since we're kind of busy with all sorts of items. You know, we will experiment with something, we'll run with it, see, take it to a certain point in time. And then if if there is the opportunity for it to succeed and succeeding, great, let's do it further. And if it's if it's not, we'll, we'll put it on hold, we'll, we'll stop it. And so we stopped that. That's a competitive area. It also ha requires, um, I mean, there's heavy regulation in the space and it's challenging. So we put it on pause. It's like a fan duel competitor. Um, yeah, I mean, it would be a very simple version of it in that you could bet yes or no so it would be events which are extremely clear cut if it's going to happen or not so let's say that you and i are going to arm wrestle and someone could bet on who's going to win so it's something where there's the outcome is a, an a or b outcome and the market can float you know it's is a, you bet 50 cents and you win some that you're, you're always paying 50 cents but you would then win a variable amount of money based on the market freely floating based on people's desires to do it. So, it's, you know, it's a mini bet. The bet is 50 cents. Maybe you'll win 60 cents. Maybe you'll win a dollar, depending on it's clear cut what it is, but it depends on um, what other people are betting against you say. So this is what's interesting to me is like, how do you decide which projects you mentioned? Like, well, we decided to put it on hold. And it seems like you take a lot of these these bets and, 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 and have a hard time like knowing how did you decide which ones to keep and which ones not to keep it has to be fun and interesting it has to you know then the question of the risk the growth potential and the cost and if we have edge i think those factors coming in make a decision so in you know that was something we launched other places were you know we're buying a business and if it's an existing business that is functioning wonderfully and we're seeking to make it better that in many ways is an easier mandate 
And so it's something we're also more committed to doing because staking, you know, there's a zero to one versus one to N question that surfaces. And sometimes one to N is easier in certain regards. We like doing playing with both because both are interesting and they could be fun. And it's, 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 it is compelling to kind of be involved in multiple different projects and a lot of excitement going on because of that. But I think that there has to be a pathway to success. And so that's a great question that we're constantly asking ourselves, like, do we buy the portfolio every day? Or that's what we live by. We want to buy the portfolio every day. So in other words, like anything we're involved in, we want to do it not just because of momentum, but because it makes sense as of today, this morning, we should still be doing this. And eventually it did not make sense for Minibat to continue. And we we're like, okay, let's pause it. Let's stop spending money on this. Do you think that you have a special attraction to two-sided marketplaces or marketplaces in general? Mm-hmm. You know, this idea of like floating prices and, and, and you know, Vemley kind of started that way. You mentioned it with Minibat. Is that something that you enjoy? So what comes to mind is marketplaces where there is inefficiencies and then identifying marketplace inefficiencies inefficiencies and fixing them. That specifically, I think, is really compelling. So, you know, there, there are marketplaces out there that might be perfectly efficient and we don't have an angle or an edge to be able to make a difference there. And it's like, OK, well, that's not for us. But if there's a marketplace that has inefficiencies and it's ripe for disruption, that could be great. That could be very compelling. My question is really how big... Uh, advice people give I've given entrepreneurs is focus on one thing you got to just do one thing and do it well and you do that 24 7 you think about it you don't sleep you just do that and I feel like you could defy that advice like, in the fly in the face of it you know, <laughs> you know like right. like how are, in the world are you able to execute on nine different companies well at the same time especially calmly I myself am not running those businesses individually so that for starters is a big component of that. I'm seeking to work on the business instead of in the business and focusing at the at the kind of enterprise level. What is our next initiative, next growth area, next business unit to launch or acquire? And so to me, that makes it a little easier. Next, I think that there is a benefit in diversity because there's always something going terribly and something going well. And everything kind of works out in the end. And by not worrying about any one thing too much, it enables the peace and tranquility and calm, I think, which is essential to be able to just focus and preserve focus. So I'm actually a big deal or a big fan of focus, right? I'm doing one thing at a time. Like I don't, I don't believe in multitasking. I actually think I can't multitask. I think no one in the world can actually multitask. That's my controversial opinion. I think people just switch between things very quickly. And I'm bad at that. You know, I can only do one thing at a time. But by really like shining that laser and like doing one thing and really trying to put all my energy into it, I think it could lead to a better outcome than being disparate. And then I think that there is kind of some benefit that comes from diversification, right? And diversification is a good thing. Um, And so that's my approach to it. And that's why we're doing all these different things. And we're able to specialize as well, as opposed to trying to be generalists. Yeah. I even was listening to Elon Musk talk about how uh, he wants to focus on this right now, but he's got a bunch of sort of grunt work he needs to get done. Didn't specify it, but I'm sure it's, you know, legal management of people because... He also has people running, you know, each individual sort of sub company, but those people got to get managed too, right? They have mm-hmm. HR issues. They, you know, they, there's concerns that roll up from them. How do you deal with the crud of even managing those nine people that manage the businesses? You know what I mean? And the meta issues that come uh, to the surface, or do you keep them from coming to you in some way? What do you mean? Like what? Be an example. Well, first mm-hmm. of all, just managing those people. Like those people report to you. So then that do you do, you know, one on ones with them and performance reviews and um, any time intensive work that comes from managing those people in their businesses. Most people are not managed by me and they're managed by someone and that makes it someone who's not me. <laughs> and and that makes it easier. So I, I do have one on ones with some people and that's great and that enables being able to find a lot of leverage and get a lot done. And my goal is seek to, where can I be helping on a very meaningful decision to be made that's either strategic in nature, negotiation-based in nature, that will be high leverage and move the needle and I'm not in someone's way. The last thing I want to do is be in the way of the business. Instead, I want to help augment little things like the ideal case is small hinges open big doors. And so, you know, it can really make a big di- difference through just the right energy applied in the right spot. And so sometimes the most important thing I'll do all week is a certain half hour conversation. I never know which conversation that's going to be, <laughs> but sometimes it might be a week. I could have gone home the rest of the week, right? If I had just done that one thing. <laughs> and so every week that's the search. It's like, okay, where's the maximum leverage I could find? 
I, I struggle with it. I don't struggle with it, but, but you know, th- th- this is part for, for me too. And I'm, I'm curious, I feel the same way, you know, some 30 minute conversation I had, oh, well just approach this. I've seen this problem a thousand times before. I, th- I think a good example is computers. You know, the three of us, I think are all pretty good at computers and I have people very close to me and family and others who will struggle with something with a computer for three hours and then they'll say, oh, I just can't get this file to do this thing, right? You know, if I right click, it doesn't show it. it's supposed to show it. And then I'm like, oh, well, obviously you just have to hold shift and then you press <laughs> the control button twice and then and then you right click. Right. And you're like, <laughs> where did you find that? Right. And yeah. it's like, well, I struggled with it for 20 hours and then I remembered that. And so when this exact situation comes up six years later, is that part of what you mean by the, you know, that equivalent is the, that little hinge opening the big door or, or is it something else? solving for something that was not already on the radar of the person doing it. And I mean, that's a great scenario, but sometimes it's also about making a certain decision and there's meaningful consequences and risk each way. So if the decision can be made with higher fidelity, that's a good outcome, right? If we could, uh, you know, if it's like a type of decision where the, the cost, where it's hard to reverse and the cost is high to make the wrong choice, that merits a lot of energy going to the decision being made. And so it may be a decision I'm a part of. And in that case, it's like, okay, let's ask the right questions to distill the right facts, to be able to figure out what's the cost and what's the benefit of it, what we're doing. I, I think actually every decision is kind of a cost benefit analysis in a way, but um, being able to like really accurately answer the cost and really accurately answer the benefits is less obvious sometimes. Because yeah, there's, good. yeah, because there's um, kind of second order like, like derivative effects that come forth from it. Because the cost benefit analysis is only as good as the person kind of doing the analysis, yeah. right? Like if they yeah. don't have very good inputs. Yeah. The, yeah. This is dovetails into, I, I want us to get into like the SAM optimization okay. tips. I feel like there's many ways in which you optimize your life that, that people could benefit from, I could benefit from. And um, so let's start with like, what is the day, what does a day in the life of SAM look like? Days are different, but generally speaking, a day that would be a good day, I would wake up and I would, I like to journal and then go to the gym after that. Now, I only work out some days, not all days, and other days are reading days if I'm not going to the gym. But so when journaling, what does that look like? It consists of kind of just writing down any thoughts in my mind. Like if, And it sometimes turns into a to-do list or sometimes it's like, oh, I forgot to tell Taylor that one thing and it's so important. Or Taylor said something and I, I'm kind of contemplating this and and mulling it over in my head. And so it's kind of like all these different thoughts that are jumping around in my head, putting them down on paper. So then I feel like I'm not forgetting anything and I can find peace and calm. And then I'll, I might review that list throughout the day or I might never look at it again. Um, I might transfer it to a to-do list, I might not. But it kind of, I'm able to find peace from that. And so that's why journaling is helpful to me. I don't do that every single day. You know, if I, if I journal four times in a week, it's a good week, right? But it's something like that. And this is pen on paper. Pen on paper, yeah. It's pen on paper. There's no distractions. My phone is not physically near me in this moment because otherwise it's too, it would be tempting to be near it or do something with it. And I write it down, pen on paper. I also like the ability to then cross things out if there's some like little thing I need to do and then I could cross it out from that list. Or it might not be a to-do list. Or if I, it might be a kind of a pros and cons list of doing an RV renovation. That's something I journaled about recently. And so it was in that journal. So, okay, so there's that. Other things that, that, so then I like to spend the time before nine o'clock working on this like thoughtfulness type of items or workout type of items. Thoughtfulness would be journaling related or reading or just like thinking broadly. And then as of nine o'clock. Like what, what kind of things do you read at that time? As an example, Measure What Matters is a book that I'm reading right now. It's a book about objectives and key results written by a venture capitalist, John Doerr, and how they employed it at Google. So that's an example of a book. So it could be something like that, which is, let's say, businessy or productivity mm-hmm. type of books, or it could be a negotiation book. I really like persuasion negotiation books. Roger Dawson is, I think, a great author who has really tactical negotiation items. Or it could be sci-fi. I like military sci-fi, and that <laughs> I alternate that into my reading regimen as well. And so, and that's more fun. I'll, I'll maybe read a few things at a time. You know, I, it's a constant temptation is to be able to quit books, which are bad, right? Because there's this like default desire to finish things that I may start, but sometimes I just don't like a book and others like it. But if I don't like it, I'm reading it super slow and then it just derails everything. Like my reading's not happening suddenly because I'm not wanting to read the book. So I try to quit books and there's many books I've started that I haven't finished. 
Like real books or Kindle or what do you use? I, everything is on Kindle. I used to have an interview question I would ask at Vimbly, which is how do you, you know, what is your favorite medium through which you like to consume your reading content? And almost every single person would say they like physical books because it's like the right answer. People feel that <laughs> saying that. But in reality, no one <laughs> reads physical books. I mean, few people do, you know, they do that, but it's like so impractical. And it's like, you know, I read Game of Thrones on the New York City subway, carrying that book with me. And like reading 10 minutes at a time. And then I was like, screw this. Like, it's going to be my phone. I'm reading this on Kindle, right? <laughs> right. Oh, all right. Nine o'clock. What happens after nine o'clock? Communication begins, which is calls and emails. And so, you know, a big fan of efficient email practices. And that's its own conversation. And we could explore that at some point. Calls with brevity. But so I would broadly put that under the category of communication. So then that's a clump of the day that might be four hours. And then comes the learning clump of the day. That's a, also a broad category, but that might entail researching a new campaign that could be either a new, a new business unit or it could be pertaining to an acquisition. It could be about how a certain tax rule works and if we could implement that and benefit from it. And so that's another component. And so these are the, the, the big buckets of communication versus learning in terms of how the day is split. So the learning's in the afternoon. Yes. And how do you, where do you put the learning? Like, say you're researching something, what's the result of that learning? Like, do you jot it down? Do you, like, use a certain note? Well, yeah, I, I use Workflowy. So w in terms of tactically where I write things down, Workflowy I think is great. I, I like that. It also works on all sorts of devices. So that's convenient. And then four things that are kind of in the learning category. If there's a new idea, most ideas die fast, like 70% of possible things that just don't work. And it starts with a question like, why does this not work? Like, could we apply, you know, how does bonus depreciation apply to depreciating business assets that we've acquired, right? Like, okay, let's research and figure out what that entails, or maybe that it ha needs certain conversations to explore that. But there might be some idea that's birthed by that, that fails quickly. Then the next set of ideas take like 25% like of them, they fail slowly. And then 5% eventually make it into something interesting. And so the learning, it's like spending 39 hours on something. And really that last hour is all that matters. The first 39 didn't, but you have, I have to pay the price of the 39 to get to the final 40th. And I know, I know you've talked about this concept of decision-making and judgment. Can you speak to maybe how that applies, right? Like how the 39th versus the 40th, is there an element of judgment in that? Is it but by judgment, I mean making good decisions or, or knowing the decisions to make, maybe. My observation and my experience has been that most things come down to just decisions being made and how good of a decision can be made. And so that maybe is judgment. And having good judgment, firstly, well, you know, what is the definition of that? But secondly, can that be learned or can it be lot not be learned? Does that come from experience? And probably the answer comes from experience. But if someone has bad judgment, can that really be changed too much? I don't know. That's like, it's like a great debate. But what I think is important <laughs> is that it feels to me that a lot of business comes down to that judgment element and for what a manager is going to do. And so making like the calls that are marginal calls. And the more interesting, the more escalated something is, the more marginal it is because the obvious ones get answered along the way, right? And so in its purest form, I think that I'm only involved in making hard decisions at Vimbly because the easy ones did not require being involved in them. All right. How does uh, how does Sam optimize his credit cards? This has been like a, a question on my mind that I just have to ask. Like, like uh, walk us through your, your process of credit card optimization over there. Well, I, you know, there's different currencies out there. I think the best currency is Chase. Chase points are really great points to use. Then there is Amex points, which I think are overrated. And I think people like <laughs> <laughs> like them too much for some reason because there's more value on chase points. Um, and then separately, one could use delta points, for example. And that's another form of currency. And there's delta status that could be gained from those credit cards as well. So I think that multiple, also there's Capital One, which is basically directly cash back. And so being able to use all of those, I think, is useful. But Chase is my favorite if I had to pick one. Well, how do you decide when to use which? Or, uh, yeah, in between those. Okay, so for example, Chase has a card which provides three times first spend, 
or three times each dollar spend on advertising revenue, something like that. And so that's a good card to use when spending money on ad spend. And then that those points can be transferred to a Chase Sapphire Reserve to get one and a half times point value on that. So that's going to be 1.5 times three points. It's four and a half cents per point. That's pretty compelling. That's the downside scenario of spending those. It could be even better. So then fine, but that has a limit that what I just said, the 3X, but there is a chase card which gives one and a half unlimited, it's like maybe called the unlimited cash card. So using that one and a half times the one and a half that comes from the chase half I reserve, that's 2.25 cents per point per kind of dollar. It's a pretty good return compared to let's say Capital One gives 2%. Mm. But the downside is you have to use that 2.25 on travel, which is a limiting agent. It's not straight cash. You have to use it on flights or hotel. Or you could transfer it to a partner and then be able to get even better, you know, if on certain, cl- uh, you know, uh, flights, it's possible to get a really good return. So I'm mindful of that. And sometimes there's a time to transfer points. Sometimes it makes sense to just use the Chase portal directly. What's a partner? A partner, you mean like like an airline? You yeah. Transfer to Emirates. Them. Yeah. Singapore Airlines. So for example, Singapore Airlines works with both Amex and Chase points. But it's a better deal to transfer Chase points to Amex points because Amex points are worth less than Chase points are worth. So it's better to pay with kind of a cheaper currency. So if you need to transfer 10,000 points into Singapore Airlines, would you rather transfer 10,000 Amex or 10,000 Chase? You'd rather transfer 10,000 Amex. Got it. What about Delta? So when do you use, when does that make sense? Delta is useful because Delta can be used to, Delta points are not that good of a deal in and of themselves, but they have certain unique flexibilities that doesn't exist elsewhere. More specifically, let's say I'm buying you a flight and I bought it with, it was a revenue fare, like I bought it with dollars. And then we, I later need to cancel that flight. They're going to issue a credit but they're going to issue the credit to your name for your flight and my name for my flight. So let's say I bought both tickets and then we get $300 back credit. Well, that kind of sucks. Like I have this $300 credit for you, but I might never buy anything again. <laughs> right. Uh, or I didn't mean that. Like, the, you know, my flight, I'm going to use eventually my $300 credit, but yours I might never use. However, if I instead use Delta points to do that and I cancel the flight, I get the points back. So I could more speculatively buy you flights, right? And then be able to cancel it and get the points back without losing that. And that's flexible. That's convenient. And that happens with Delta points. Interesting. Did so not for that. family members, for example, if you want to buy, you know, <coughs> your, your brother a flight, but you're not really sure if he's going to take it, or you think that like, <laughs> he's going to cancel it a week beforehand, right? That's a great way to use the Delta points. I have an optimization question. Can you speak to keyboard shortcuts? Like how I've, how do you use them? How did you learn them? How do you continue to learn them? What would you is there like one you would advise? Like can you just speak to that? I love keyboard shortcuts. So the way I would learn them. So firstly, like, you know, Mac is great for a lot of things, but PC is better with shortcuts generally. Mm-hmm. And with, with a PC, it, it very much kind of discloses shortcuts. So if you could like click file, you know, or edit, it like shows you with like an underline in the E what the, the shortcut is, and then I just slowly use that over time and try to do everything possible without the mouse. And, you know, there are some things you need the mouse for no matter what. But once you get used to the shortcuts, you go super fast. Okay, so more tangibly, Gmail or Google's apps, G Suite, there are amazing shortcuts available there. You have to turn it on. You go into settings and the keyboard shortcuts turn it on. And once you do that, it like doubles your productivity. The speed through which you can move through your inbox is tremendous. So we internally have documents and we encourage people to do it. And then we kind of highlight the best shortcuts. But if you hit, it's either shift question mark or control question mark, a command question mark on Mac in a, on Gmail, it'll, it'll pop up the shortcuts and then you know them and you could use them and it changes everything. Same with Google Calendar, right? And in general, most apps any, or any application that's a real application and a good one <laughs> has shortcuts. Yeah, like a, a good one in Google. So, so I, I'm also a big keyboard shortcut person, but I wasn't using them in email until you actually pushed me to. But but in you know, Google Calendar, you can press T, that goes to today. You can press W, changes to week. I can press month. I can, you totally. know, and just swipe through it and press N to go to the next, 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 and then, and then, and P, 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 P to go back. And it becomes so second nature. It could be super fast with it. And it, it really, it doubles efficiency. It reduces errors too, because I might click on the wrong thing, but it's unlikely I'm going to press the wrong button. I constantly try to learn more and more of the shortcuts. And after doing that for a long time, you know, one becomes quite fluent with them and the esoteric ones, it's, you know, they also become useful. So for example, using the bracket buttons in Gmail is really good. So if you're in an email and you want to archive and go to the next email, instead of having to press E, which is archive, and then like navigate to the next one and hit enter, you could press like left bracket. And that means archive and go next, you know, or right bracket, oh. it's the same thing. 
just blew Flavius mind. I did mind. not yeah. know that. Yeah, likewise, let's say you wanted to just go to the next email without archiving. It's you know J for previous or K for forward, right? And so you know there's a distinction between using the JK versus using the brackets. It's whether you want to archive it or not. And this let, is just second nature to you at this point. Totally, yeah. Or let's say you're in a thread and there's like 10 messages in a certain thread and you want to go to like the next message, like N for next, you press that and it'll jump to the next one, next one, next one. Let's say it's collapsed, you press O for open, it opens mm. it, you know, or you press P to go to the previous. So now you're like flying, you're flying, you're just doing it, you're not touching the mouse, you know, and then you can hit R if you need to reply, or A for reply all, write your message, command enter, you know, and you can send it, hit X. If you press X, then it goes back to inbox and clicks to select that one, right? So now it's selected. And you could like go to the next email, like just with the arrow keys, go into it, press X. And now you could like have multiple, just you could batch process hitting E archive for a huge amount of that. You are such a nerd. Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, all right, well, while we're on email, I said earlier you had like some other email tips. Let's, let's, let's knock them all out now. What else is like on the... Well-written emails take thought, right? So the first part is obvious where it's like, okay, like this old Mark Twain quote, like, sorry, this letter's so long. I did not spend enough time to make it shorter. Okay, so it is the burden of the employee when emailing their manager in order to put the extra energy in to make the email more readable and then make it so it saves the manager time. So if if not, and if it's not culturally instilled, then like a lazy person just can like barf out an email right? <laughs> and it's going to be a stream of consciousness and it's hard to read and distill the essence of and that shouldn't happen because then it's wasting time for the person reading it. So a good structure for an email and something that we seek to enforce is that Someone writing emails to the manager is going to say, hey. so if, if what's the point of the email? If the, if the point is to say a decision being made and here is how you could adjust it, it might say, hey, here's a choice we have to make between A and B. I think A is the better one because of X, Y, Z reasons. So I'm going to go with A. Let me know if you have any qualms with that or if you think otherwise. So now the manager can respond and just say, hmm. sounds good, do it, right? <laughs> and like, that's it. That's the whole email, right? So it's, it's tailored so that it's the person responding can spend minimal effort consuming and responding that email. It's written in like a really good way. Likewise, if choosing between five options, you know, it's like, okay, here's A, B, C, D, E. You hear this? Here's the summary of the options. Here's the explanation of what each of the options, the ramifications are. I think the best answer is D. Let me know if otherwise, right? Again, the person could respond with saying, now let's do B. Or they could say, D sounds good, let's do it, right? So when possible, phrasing things in a yes, no way is a really good way. Like, I want to go to this conference, costs this for us, here's the budget, here's the team who's gonna come, here's what we should do, do you have any qualms? All right, easy to respond saying no qualms, do it, right? So this is a approach, right, that we stylistically incorporate. So, the, you know, then, you know, batch processing and instilling batch processing. I like Boomerang, it's a tool to enable sending emails. So I'll sometimes, I'll, I'll, if I'm reading an email in, on the weekend or processing my inbox on the weekend, I wanna email team members, I don't want to hit them on 3 p.m. on a Saturday on something which isn't important and urgent because it's disruptive to them. They might see it. They wonder, oh, is this important? He's emailing me at 3 p.m. And so I don't want to do that. Instead, I'll boomerang it from Monday at 8 a.m. And 8 a.m. is like my encoded boomerang time and of, of, a, of a business day. And that way, also, once that happens enough times, people know that it was kind of boomerang, but it's not, it's, it's just mindful. It's, it's a... It's a non-selfish mm -hmm. email, right? Because it's respectful right. of the person's time. And, and and this way, this mutual respect for appropriate urgency is very good communication. Because once in a while, if something is urgent, people understand that and can respond mm -hmm. faster. That requires the manager being respectful of team members' time, in a sense. Is there other other mutual email faux pas that, that people make? I think a big one is, <laughs> like a funny one is, like thoughtful calendar invites. So let's say that we're getting drinks. I'm getting drinks with Flavio. And so I'm like, hey, I'll send you a calendar invite. And I put it in my calendar, drinks with Flavio. <laughs> and then I invite you. And then you receive an email, like a calendar invite, which has your own name on it <laughs> at 60. It's like a useless, selfish, inv I hit no on those. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll respond be like, hey, um, can we make this something that's like a more sensible name perhaps? <laughs> And, I'm like, uh, and that's only if I want to invest in like, you know, politely sharing, like, hey, let's make it say like drinks, colon, Sam slash Flavio, right? And if I'm writing the invite, I'll actually put my name first, right? Because like on my calendar, it's convenient for me to actually say your name first. I don't want to put my name on it. I know it's, I'm involved in it. It's on my calendar, right? So I put your name normally. But if I'm emailing it to you, and you're gonna get it. So likewise, what's convenient for me is not convenient for you, but it's more convenient for you for it to say drinks, colon, 
Sam slash Flavio, right? And so I'll do it that way. I think that's like a thoughtful calendar invite, right? And likewise, when people do that, so that's something that internally you think about. Calendar invites in general should be like very good descriptors of what's going on with minimal words when possible. So that's an example that comes to mind. Hmm. What else is on email? Are you an inbox zero person? I'm like a semi inbox zero person. So, so broadly speaking, the short answer is yes. The longer answer, like if you ask me right now, how many emails are in my inbox? If I had finished processing it in, you know, there might be six is the answer. Uh, why six? Well, there might be something that makes sense that I like, haven't responded to and I need to, and I'm imminently going to. And so maybe that's what's there. But yeah, broadly, I think inbox zero is important. I think everyone should do it. I think it's, it's a matter of like triaging the pain, the patients at the hospital, right? Like if someone's emailing you a bunch of things, if you're getting a bunch of emails and you are buried in your inbox, sometimes something super urgent is there. And if it's buried because the inbox is too fat with everything else, the patient dies in the hospital. It's like in the emergency room, people come in and like the people who are bleeding out need to be attended to. And the people who are just like doing something that's not so urgent, they go to a separate line. And like, if we start treating the patients in the triage room, it's, it's the whole thing's going to collapse, right? So the triaging aspect of it, I'm a big believer in, that's inbox zero. When do you check it? Like all throughout the day as it happens or do you have like certain windows? No, I um, like I see. So during the communication time is where I'll do it. Uh, so there's best practices and what ends up happening in practice. So my best practice is I seek to do it twice a day. However, in reality, there are certain time. Like if I had a certain call that ended 10 minutes early and then I have 10 extra minutes, I will be OK with going in and doing that. Unless there's a specific reason not to, then I'll contribute that if it's part of my communication block. I like sitting with do not disturb mode on or, you know, focus mode it's called now. And, you know, I think no one should ever take calls from numbers they don't know. I generally don't believe in unsolicited phone call, like a call that's unplanned or unscheduled unless it's like from a friend is also disruptive, especially during the day. Yeah. Disclosing agendas. So if someone wants to put forth a call, the burden is on the person suggesting the call to disclose what the purpose of the call is going to be. And um, especially if it's intra-team. I mean, that's important. Meetings are really expensive, of course. So, you know, should be avoided unless critical. So nobody should email you and say, hey, Sam, do you have five minutes this afternoon? Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. There are no five minute calls. Right. It's also, it's actually, it's, um, it's lazy for someone to do. That. It's disrespectful. It's accidentally disrespectful. If I email you and I say, hey, do you have five minutes to talk? And I don't tell you what it's about. It's because I'm too lazy. I, I'm either trying to trap you because it's, we're going to talk about something you don't want to talk about, or I don't want to spend the extra few moments to write out what my intentions are. And because of that, I expect you to spend the extra few <laughs> moments to do that. Right. And so that's disrespectful. It's selfish. It's Cause, selfish. Cause, because it's yeah. like, oh, I, I, I yeah, expect like, that you're going to yeah, say like, yes. I, I, I'm, it's just easier. It's easier for me right. to, to, to not do this work. And I'll just, I'll infringe on your time and liberty. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other last thoughts, questions for Sam? Any, any questions? Any tips and tricks you want to share with you founders share out there? Ask? To founders out there? Yeah, like early stage founders, people thinking about founding a company. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of tax efficiency in in businesses. That's an exciting area. I think that there's some great programs out there. Like the SBA programs are great programs for raising debt capital to buy businesses or raise working capital for existing businesses. I think it's an exciting area to explore. Anything you want to promote? I mean, more info about me and us on VimbleyGroup.com. Anything to promote? We're we're working on, uh, uh, not at the moment. Yeah. VimbleGroup.com has got what we have, and that's, that's it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. All right. All what right. do you think, Taylor? I think it's a wrap. Appreciate you coming in, Sam. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me. See you. Bye. Bye. Woo! Thank you for rocking with the homies. Taylor Trusty and Flavio. Seize the day on it. Until next time. Hold it down. Hold it down.